All right, good afternoon, everyone. So today we are going to talk about tiny ML and efficient deep learning computing to make AI more efficient on edge devices. So today's AI is too big. Um, it takes a lot of uh, efforts to train and inference for those models, like GPT-3, 175 billion parameters, costing $4.8 million to train. Uh, however, there's a huge demand if you want to deploy those AI models on edge devices, right? We can have better latency, lower cost, and doesn't sacrifice users' privacy, not having to send the data to the cloud, but be able to process them locally on our edge devices. So there is a huge gap, right? To achieve those low latency, low energy, low cost, and better privacy, we need to change both the algorithm to design efficient algorithms and also efficient hardware. Um, we need the algorithm and hardware co-design. So conventionally, uh, algorithm and hardware are designed separately. But now we want to open the box to see what exactly are the opportunities in efficient neural network design and to better fit those domain-specific hardware platforms. Right? And we find there is actually a huge room at the top by optimizing the algorithm. Right? And we find those deep neural networks can be significantly compressed and simplified. So that, um, as we can see here, uh, the energy consumption uh, is dominated by those memory axes. If we can compress the model, reduce the size of the model, it will be much easier to squeeze those neural networks into tiny little uh, edge AI hardware platforms. So it is those um, SRAM and, and memory access that is draining the battery. So if we can reduce the model size, we can also save uh, the battery life. So this is our, our effort on tiny ML. Rather than using a lot of computation, a lot of engineering efforts to tune the models that require a lot of training data, we want to have less computation, less carbon emission, uh, deploy on small little edge devices, much cheaper and fewer engineers with less data. So this is our first uh, effort called deep compression, where we can uh, compress a given neural network by pruning and quantization. By pruning, we can remove those redundant connections. We can remove nine to thir 13 times uh, the connections without losing any accuracy. Um, and then we can further quantize the models to fewer, uh, lower precision, like four bits or eight bits. By combining these techniques, we can compress ResNet 50 from 100 megabytes to only six megabytes without losing any, any accuracy. So this facilitates uh, the uh, model to be deployed on mobile devices. And this pruning and sparsity is getting increased adoption both by industry and academia since 2015, uh, where we can see the number of publications are growing exponentially uh, in recent years since 2015. And this technique has also been adopted uh, by D5 Tech, a startup co-founded uh, previously and now acquired by Xilinx, now part of AMD, where uh, they are using this technique to accelerate neural networks on FPGAs. So are there more opportunities beyond the compressing an existing model, right? So rather than compressing a large and bulky model, can we design small and compact models to, to, to begin with? So this is our recent endeavor called hardware-aware neural architecture search, which is a brand new technique for edge AI. So previously, uh, people rely on manual design to tune the number of layers, the channels, the branches, resolution, kernel size to fit a particular hardware platform, to fit the memory constraint, get a targeted latency, right? This is very, uh, it's a black magic. It is notoriously hard to tune. So what we propose is automatic design using hardware-aware AutoML techniques to synthesize neural networks automatically given a latency, uh, accuracy, and memory constraints. This is like an EDA tool for neural network design. Uh, previously, we have to train the model to evaluate its accuracy and latency, which is very time consuming, right? We have to train the model and to see whether it fit our latency constraint, whether the, t the target accuracy is met, and we repeat this process to select the best one. We propose a much more efficient technique to train a once-for-all network, okay? It is sparsely activated, and then we can select the sub-network without any retraining to get the accuracy and latency, which is much cheaper. We repeat this process from 
uh, sampling from this once for all network, select the best fit so that we can drastically reduce the design cost, similar to training a neural network only once. And the benefit of that by using this once for all network is that uh, users may have those high-end iPhone 13 or low-end uh, phones. We want to be inclusive for users who also have those low-end phones, right? But it's very expensive to, to design neural networks of different sizes, large and small. So by once for all network, we train only once, and then we can get many different sub-networks for free to fit diverse hardware constraints, like fit different um, generations of mobile phones, and also fit different generations of mobile chips from the, late, uh, from the 888 Snapdragon chip to an older uh, 820 Snapdragon chip. And also fit different scenarios where we have the full battery or we, have, we are in the battery saving mode. We no longer have to um, train different nets for different scenarios, but one single network, but select different part of it to fit different scenarios. And also for complicated tasks, for transfer learning on complicated tasks or more difficult data set, we can use a larger subnetwork. And for a smaller one, we can use a smaller subnetwork. So by using this approach, we can train 10 to the 19 networks at the same time, which greatly uh, reduced the carbon footprint and also amortized the training cost when we are trying to find a specialized subnetwork given a hardware constraint. We can select a larger one for the cloud. We can select a smaller subnetwork for the edge. So this is a comparison of once for all network running on Qualcomm uh, Snapdragon uh, CPU. So we can reduce the latency by up to 2.6 times faster, right? With even better accuracy from 79.8 to 80.1. And we reduce the latency from more than 300 milliseconds to only like 150 milliseconds. So this is without changing the silicon, but increasing the utilization on top of existing silicon. And also we no longer require training different times, but just train only once, but get the entire Pareto optimal curve in the trade-off between the latency and accuracy. Not just on a single chip, but when we have diverse chips to fit, uh, we can use this once for all network to generate different sub-networks that can fit diverse hardware platforms without having to retrain for each scenario to find the specialized, the best fit neural network for each chip. And also we, we have this tool that can slide left to get a faster and a more, less accurate model and slide to the right to get a, a slower but higher accuracy model, uh, just like an EDA tool for designing neural networks to design, given a latency, design the best accuracy model for uh, this particular hardware platforms. And on the bottom is showing the visualization of the neural network architecture under the, uh, the current constraint. Traditionally, it used to require a lot of hand tuning for different devices, for different latency constraints, but this once for all network can auto design the different neural nets and fit uh, at a very low cost. We also perform the roof line analysis to understand the hardware utilization we usually find there's a huge gap between the actual performance versus the peak performance of a given silicon platform. For example, on the FPGA, um, uh, Google's Mobile v 2 and Google's MNASNet have a performance of only about 44 to 48 giga ops per second. But without changing the silicon, but design, but only design smarter and more um, best fit neural network architectures, we can improve the G ops per second to 76. So this is a huge improvement at a very low cost. You don't have to design new silicon, but just design new neural networks that best fit that particular silicon platform. And this also improved the uh, operations per byte, which alleviates the memory wall, um, which have a better uh, memory friendly. So not only on one task, but also this technique on diverse uh, vision tasks, from detection to segmentation, we can reduce the computation by 10 times, six, four times and 10 times for action recognition, 2.7 times for semantic segmentation, 12x for generative models, 4.8 times reduction for pose estimation, and about 2.9 times for visual wake words, and also uh, 2.5 times uh, actual, uh, 
model reduction for gaze estimation. So this one, uh, this tool generates very well to diverse vision applications. So this is a particular case study for um, poles estimation on Qualcomm uh, Snapdragon 855, where we can uh, see on this trade-off curve between the uh, latency on the axis, axis and the accuracy on the y-axis. Ideally, we want it on the uh, top left corner where we have low latency and high, high accuracy. So by using uh, uh, this uh, new hardware aware neural architecture search, we can reduce the latency by 4.9 times, okay, latency reduction uh, with, uh, with even better accuracy. And we can deploy it on the phone in real time to act recognize people's uh, gestures and understand the activity. And the demo is available at the booth of OpenML. And this is another demo for uh, photo editing, where it used to be pretty slow running on a laptop to use the GAN models to uh, edit the face of, of, of this lady. For example, we can uh, make her look younger, but it's very uh, long latency, You taking three seconds running on a laptop. That's because running these generative models, we need pixel-wise prediction, which is much more challenging than in the, uh, running um, like detection and classification where we just wanna give a single label, right? But by using once for all technique, we can train once and get a smaller subnetwork at low cost for uh, fast prototyping. So we can switch to this any cost again and run the same, uh, same model and we can make the lady smile and we can see it's in real time, only takes 0 0.3 uh, seconds. For fast prototyping on tablets, you can put it on an Android uh, tablet or iPad. We can also change the hair color. It's very responsive um, and greatly accelerated such uh, interactive photo editing on these edge devices. And also, once for all technique works well on natural language processing as well. So we worked on this once for all transformer where we can train a, a super transformer and then specialize different sub transformers for different scenarios. For example, on IoT device, we can use a smaller sub-transformer uh, for like a, a microcontroller, for example, our Raspberry Pi. And on the right-hand side, it's showing that the latency on Raspberry Pi uh, for doing machine translation can be uh, reduced the latency by 2.7 times, and we can uh, reduce the model size by 3.7 times. So this technique on uh, once for technique uh, it's been widely integrated by industry, uh, including uh, Amazon Auto Bloom, Facebook PyTorch, uh, Intel, um, and also uh, NVIDIA, and also Qualcomm uh, using these techniques. And it achi also achieved multiple uh, low power computer vision challenges for the past three years. Uh, it's the winning solution for all the, pretty much all the uh, tracks of the low power computer vision challenge. The next question is, can we go even smaller beyond mobile phones? How about microcontrollers? Okay. We believe the future belongs to tiny AI, where there are billions of IoT devices around the world based on those tiny little devices. They are much cheaper, like $1 to $2, uh, much smaller, and almost everywhere in our lives. Even low-income people, we want to enable them to afford uh, such um, capability to democratize AI and can unlock many uh, smart home applications, smart manufacturing, healthcare, and driving assistance. But the challenge is the edge AI is very memory constrained. Okay? For a memory microcontroller, the amount of memory resource is four orders of magnitude smaller than a GPU, like 32, from 32 gigabytes available in the cloud GPU to like four gigabytes on a mobile phone to only 256 kilobyte on a tiny microcontroller. Okay, so how do we deal with such tight memory constraint? So we designed ways, methods to conquer this challenge and de to deploy neural nets on such tiny little devices. And the work is called MCU Net with system and algorithm co-design. So just now we talk about neural architecture search called NAS where we can adapt the neural network to fit a hardware platform a search neural network model on existing uh, libraries. 
Another approach, like TVM, is to tune the, t uh, the deep learning library given a particular neural network model. Okay? And our approach is to co-design the neural, architecture, neural network architecture and the inference engine together uh, to propose an efficient neural network architecture and also the efficient uh, runtime together. So uh, with TinyNAS, we designed the best fit neural network architecture for a particular microcontroller and use Tiny Engine to run inference. So by doing that, we can actually achieve a huge reduction for the uh, memory footprint. So uh, the blue one on the bottom right hand side is the Mobana V2 with TensorFlow Lite Micro from Google. Uh, so the task is detecting person. And the X axis is the memory, uh, memory footprint, the Y axis is the accuracy. Our result in 2019 is roughly requiring uh, 256 kilobytes of SRAM. One year later, in MCUNet, we pushed that um, to, 250, uh, to 128 kilobyte, 2x reduction. And last year, we even further pushed it to only 30 kilobyte of memory consumption, uh, but maintaining the accuracy with even better, higher accuracy. That's the red line. Okay? So imagine what you can do with only 30 kilobyte of memory only a one to two dollar of micro microcontroller. Now we can do this complicated vision task um, with such little tiny resource. And you don't have to reinvent new silicon, this is just on top of existing a simple ARM chip. Um, very small little camera on Cort ARM Cortex M7 microcontroller. And we can do vision tasks such as uh, uh, people detection. We can draw the bonding box for the people sitting far away uh, from the chair. It's not surprising we can do object detection, but do object detection on touch with such tiny little memory resource is really amazing. And that is thanks to MCUNet, where we co design the neural network with Tiny NAS together with an efficient inference engine called Tiny Engine. And the demo is available in the booth of OmniML, where we have integrated all these flows into the startup OmniML uh, for these techniques. So if you have similar need in your, uh, your company, welcome to talk to us. We'd love to help you. So not only for images, but also for video recognition, we find that there's a lot of redundancy and can be uh, greatly accelerated. So we propose that this temporal shift module to eliminate the redundancy in the temporary redundancy in video understanding and can accelerate video understanding from uh, more than 164 milliseconds per video to only 17 milliseconds, so nine times speed up. So this is demo is showing on the left hand side. Without our technique, each row is a video. It's moving pretty slowly, like only processing six videos per second. With our technique, we can process 77 videos per second on the same hardware platform. So this is a demo showing the uh, understanding of what we are doing, like moving something closer to something or hitting something with something. On the right hand side, we can also understand why the neural network is thinking like we are moving something away, it's highlighting the region and also the time frame corresponding to move something away and also wiping. So it's also interpretable and faster. We also apply the tiny ML to auto driving tasks. So in collaboration with Professor Roos, we accelerated this uh, LiDAR point cloud processing for self-driving cars from five frames per second, which is too slow to drive a car, to 47 frames per second, which is more than real time, so that, so that we can drive the car. And also we can do sensor fusion using not only LiDAR, but also camera together in both uh, rainy, rainy days and also in daytime and also in the nighttime. And this LiDAR processing is very sparse and very complicated, but using this co-optimization of kernel and also neural architecture search, we can make it a real time. And this technique has also been deployed at MIT Driverless, which is an autonomous racing vehicle. And it can improve the accuracy of the cone detection from 95% to 99%. And also uh, improving the range from 8 meters to 12 meters without changing any hardware. And for even, even more challenging tasks, we can fuse multiple cameras, in the, which is uh, widely demanded in autom automotive, automotive applications for sensor fusion, where we have the front view camera, the rear view ca camera, 
here we have six cameras together, and we want to find the objects in the bird eye view for each of them. So we accelerated the whole process by 4.8 times faster, okay, with 10 times less number of computation, but maintaining the state of the art accuracy during the 3D bounding box, which can um, uh, be able to help a lot of ADAS applications. And similarly, we can help with uh, natural language processing tasks, reducing the uh, model size from 700 megabytes to only 28 megabytes, while fully maintaining the, the blue score of uh, this machine translation task. Okay, so far we talk about inference. We also um, put a lot of endeavor on transfer learning to be able to continually adapt to new data collected from the sensors to be able to do online transfer learning on edge devices. So not only inference, but also retraining uh, the model on edge devices. Okay? Since we don't want to send the data to the cloud to better preserve users' accuracy. But edge device, again, is very memory limited. So we propose this tiny transfer learning technique that can reduce the training memory from 300 megabytes to only 16 megabytes. And also we worked on federated on-device learning where we share the gradient rather than share the data. And user data uh, never leaves the device but preserve the privacy. However, these edge devices are connected either through Wi-Fi or cellular network. The bandwidth is limited and the latency is pretty long. Okay? How do we deal with the limited communication bandwidth and also the long, long latency for mobile devices? So our solution is by using the technique called deep gradient compression, where we can reduce the gradient by 500 times um, without losing any accuracy. So there's the communication bandwidth is greatly reduced. We can also use the technique called delayed gradient averaging to tolerate the long latency between the devices. So on the right hand, on left hand side is eight Raspberry Pis that we connected together to jointly learn so that the model can get better. By using these techniques, we can achieve a speed up um, from the baseline using FAT average um, from uh, about uh, four, uh, four times with 16 nodes to 13 times with 16 nodes. So the theoretical speed up is 16, and we improved the, latent, uh, the uh, throughput by almost three, three times. So this is a demo where we also enable this online learning on a tiny little microcontroller. So this is a demo board on STM32 uh, M7 microcontroller. So originally it cannot recognize, a bit, uh, distinguish between apple, uh, the orange and banana, but given a few buttons of, of labeling, we can learn this on this little device that has only uh, 320 kilobytes of memory. This is not challenging a GPU, which like a thousand dollar GPU, this is not, not, not Challenging, but on a like three dollar microcontroller to do such uh, on device learning, it is very beneficial to democratize AI uh, to those financially disadvantaged population. So after a few times of training, we can rec uh, distinguish between different objects very well. And finally, um, beyond computation, data is also very expensive. Uh, very. It takes months or even years to train and collect, uh, to collect and label. And we try to reduce the data required for training those GAN models. For example, if we reduce the training data to only 100 images, previously the model uh, generated images with very poor quality. But on the second row is by using our technique called diff augment, differentiable augmentation. Uh, we can generate real uh, uh, photorealistic images with only 100 images. This is another example uh, of uh, generating for myself uh, photorealistic data, data with only 100 images. And uh, analytically, we can reduce the training images from 70,000 images to only 100, but the performance is neck and neck with the baseline models. And here are more visualizations of efficient training with fewer uh, images. So in summary, today we talk about uh, tiny ML and the efficient deep learning, uh, which used to require a lot of computation, a lot of carbon, difficult to deploy on edge devices. But there's a huge uh, demand for deploying AI on the edge to save the cost, preserve the privacy, and also reduce the latency. OK, 
Okay, so our technique can reduce a lot of computation to a fewer computation, less computation. A lot of engineers to only a fewer engineers by using these automated tools, these auto ML tools, these hardware aware neural architecture search tools to help with edge AI and also uh, be able to not only do inference but also training on these edge devices with less data. So thank you for your attention and I would be super uh, glad to help you if you encounter similar, uh, similar questions and look forward to more collaborations. Okay, I'll take a question. So uh, cloud use is exploding. How will this affect uh, this edge AI? Right. So there's a combination of, uh, with the increased amount of sensors, right? IoT is enabled by the cloud and also the edge, right? So the synergy between the cloud and edge is motivating us to uh, put the workload on either side, right? So we can even do part of the computation on the edge, part of the computation on the cloud. Um, and also there are scenarios where we cannot just afford to run them on the cloud. For example, if it is privacy critical, right? Or for a self-driving car where latency is very critical and some rural areas you don't, even don't have the internet connection, but you don't still want the car to be able to drive uh, in those areas. So those are the scenarios where uh, cloud computing uh, has the limitation. And sometimes cloud computing and edge device can help each other uh, with uh, um, if it's not um, if the latency is not critical, and also they can collaborate for such as federated learning. They can collaborate. 